Howdy and welcome to the 10-Week Bible Study. This is week 5, day 1 of our study of Luke. I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and today we're talking about Luke 10, 1 through 24. Welcome back to the 10 Week Bible Study. I want to invite you to check out all of the extra content we have over at 10weekbible.com. There you can find links to purchase hard copy and Kindle versions of many of the studies we've done and a host of other resources, including podcast archives. Check out 10weekbible.com today. With that, let's go ahead and pray before we start today. Lord, would you open our eyes and our ears to hear what your word has to say to us, God? Speak to us. Fill our hearts with the knowledge of you. Fascinate us with your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With that, let's go ahead and jump into the the word today. We'll be reading from the NIV. This is Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of them to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you that it'll be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. That day that Jesus is talking about is the the day of judgment, the day of the Lord when it comes to a a town or a people group. So Jesus is sending out his disciples. And and it's not just the 12, it's the 72 that are with him. There's there's 72 people that are, are closest to him but they're not the 12, obviously. And he's sending them out two by two. All right, he's already done this. And he, he's, he's doing this again, telling them to go out and, and, and heal the sick. You know, do all of the things that you've seen me doing. And he gives them the anointing, the authority to do that. I mean, how amazing is that? And then he gives them this set of instructions, right? And, and I, again, I've said this before, but I want to reiterate here. Jesus is, is not saying every single time, every single person on planet earth goes out as a missionary, goes out with the gospel, they need to do it exactly this way. He's instructing them very specifically for their context to go and do this. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't look at this and say, there's a lot of good stuff here. And it doesn't mean that there's not times where the Lord might not call us to do exactly this again. I have friends who've been uh, missionaries all over the world in different uh, cultures and contexts, and they've seen the Lord work in some pretty amazing ways. I've had friends who have done exactly this, and I've had friends who've done things very differently than this, and I've seen, and, and the Lord has blessed all of them. There's also people who have done this very thing and seen no fruit, seen no power, seen nothing, and and there's been people who have done the opposite of this and seen no fruit. The point that I'm making with all of that is, is when we go out to share the gospel, when we're going out, we need to be led by the Holy Spirit in our context, in our time. The Bible is, is often referred to as a, an, an owner's manual for life. And there's some truth to that. There really is a lot of truth that the, you know, the Bible can lead us. It definitely leads us into all truth. But there's nowhere in the Bible that says, hey, Darren, this is what you need to have for breakfast on this day here. You know, it's it's not going to do that. But the Holy Spirit can actually lead and guide us and direct us. I may wake up one morning and just feel led from the Holy Spirit that I should go have breakfast at Denny's or something like that. And I may wander into Denny's because I'm, I'm, I don't know, but I'm, I'm feeling led of the Holy Spirit to go do that. Or maybe my stomach is leading me there and I go there 
And the Lord has got some kind of divine appointment, someone who needs to hear the gospel that day is my 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 waiter or waitress, or there's someone sitting at the table next to me, or someone I'm going to be waiting at uh, next to in line. The Lord does those kinds of things. And so the, the Bible leads us into that truth, but we have this living, active relationship with the Holy Spirit, and he leads and guides us into those things. So there's a lot to learn from this passage, and and I've spent time doing missions overseas, and I've gone through lots of missionary training, preparing for those things, and this is definitely one of those favorite passages, and there's a lot to glean here. This person of peace, this is a big deal. This really is a big deal, going and, and finding someone who is is apparently and obviously open and receptive to the gospel because they're not immediately hostile to even your presence when you walk into their town. That's a big sign. That's Jesus being like, listen, when you go in and they're all hostile to you, don't keep pressing on them, seeing if you can get them to like soften up just a little bit. <clears throat> really, Jesus is telling us a little bit the opposite of what is, is human nature, what we generally desire to do. Uh, generally speaking, People want to go after the the people that look like them, the people that they like, the people that talk like them. Those are the easiest people for us to relate to, but they're not always the people of, of peace, as Jesus is describing here. Actually, what Jesus is telling us is he's like saying, go into a town and find the low-hanging fruit. Find the people that are already sensitive open to like letting you into their home without even knowing you there's something going on there because that's not really normal even if you're in a culture that's incredibly hospitable and there are different cultures across planet earth and throughout time that have are much more hospitable than others but even in hospitable cultures it's not terribly normal to be like oh my goodness you're a messenger from just out of town come and stay at my house this is a sign this is a sign that, hey, something's going on here. Start with them. And I think that is a that is a, a, a good thing for us to realize. And that doesn't mean that we don't pray for our loved ones. We don't pray for our friends. But very often I've seen people be very ineffective at sharing the gospel when they only share the gospel with the people that they want to share the gospel with, as opposed to asking the Holy Spirit, who is it that you want me to share the gospel with today? Who is it you want me to come into contact with today and share your love, share your heart with? <clears throat> I encourage you, and, and this is for me as well, I need this constant encouragement on my life as it, it can be so easy to get busy and it, with just the cares of life. You got errands and kids and just all of the stuff that we juggle to go about our day without thinking about the people and the situations around us. And it's really beneficial before we start a day, before we go out, Lord, do you have anyone for me to meet today? Lord, open my eyes that I would see the people around me speak to me, whisper in my ear about the people around me that I would share your love, share your gospel with them today, wherever I go, if I'm in the grocery store, if I'm at the post office, at my job, whatever I'm doing, I want to be open and receptive to hearing the voice of the Lord and hearing the stirrings of the Lord. I mean, if if I when I say hearing the voice of the Lord, maybe that freaks you out, but what I'm saying is like, sometimes there's just this, we just have this sense of like, maybe I should go talk to so-and-so. And it's just this intuition. It's this thing inside of us. And it, it feels weird. And sometimes nothing happens. But other times we go over and we find out that, oh my goodness, that person is going through something terrible right now. And they really needed encouragement or they needed to hear that the Lord knows them and sees them and desires them. Those kinds of things really are important. And that's how the Lord works most of the time through our lives is we're just sensitive to what he's stirring us to do and then we act on it. And the more we act on that, the more we see him work. But back to the passage. Jesus gives them a very prescriptive thing to do to go out and reach the lost in the towns that he's planning on going to. And again, this is is not always prescriptive for us, but we can glean so much. And I've just hit some of the high points. Let's continue on. Verse 13. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. 
For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. But whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me. I mean, this is harsh words from Jesus. Harsh words. When people talk about, you know, Jesus kind of being this warm, fuzzy guy that just wants to have a beer with you and it's kind of cool with you and sin's not a big deal and all of those kind of things. We hear that message of Jesus. We hear that version of Jesus preached more and more nowadays. And when we read things like this, when we read him saying things like this, it doesn't match with that Jesus that's just this teddy bear Jesus that's just kind of cool with everything and don't worry about sin. I got it covered and all that. That's not a real Jesus. That's a false God, a false idol that people have created that they've named Jesus. But when we read things like this, we don't see that in Jesus. He's saying, listen, I came to you. I mean, this is basically, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here and, and, and adding this into it, but he's basically saying, I came from heaven. I created this place. I came down to you. I told you what to do and you disobeyed. You rejected me. So it's going to be better for Sodom and Gomorrah, the one, the, the city that I destroyed with hellfire and brimstone, literally. It's going to be better for them than it is for you because you rejected me. That is crazy harsh. There is no teddy bear Jesus in that. And so this idea that's worked its way into the church, that Jesus doesn't really require obedience, that there's grace in the New Testament, and you kind of do whatever you want and get away with it. It's not a big deal because Jesus is, he just loves us and he's covered our sins and it's not a big deal. That's not what Jesus is saying at all. He's saying, you have to accept me. You cannot reject me and you cannot reject his, his teaching. You cannot go against him. Our allegiance has to be primarily to Jesus or he's got really harsh things to say. Now, the, the, the great thing is once our allegiance is pledged to Jesus, once we've given our lives and our hearts to him, we can't hardly screw up. Right. I mean, doesn't mean that we won't sin. It doesn't mean we won't stumble. But when our hearts are for him, when we are when we set our gaze on him and we're moving toward him, it is really difficult to get crosswise with him. He has almost nothing but good things to say to us once we've accepted him. But if we stand in rejection of him, he has nothing but harsh things to say. Continuing on verse 17. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirit submits you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This is an interesting passage about Jesus seeing Satan fall from, from heaven um, there's a lot made of this theologically. People will say, you know, well, Satan has been thrown down from heaven at the cross and, and he doesn't have access to us anymore. And he doesn't, um, he, 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 he doesn't influence us. He doesn't cause us to sin anymore. And so there's, there's actually people nowadays that say, you know, that you should never repent again. You should never repent after you've accepted Jesus and come to him. Because Satan is not in heaven, he doesn't have access to heaven anymore, and he doesn't accuse us, and so there is no more sin. And and this is, biblically speaking, not true. Even Peter says later on, um, you know, in in, in Acts, and and, uh, Paul references this, it's all throughout the New Testament after the cross that Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. And even in Revelation, it talks about this coming throwing down. So Jesus is, is, I believe, speaking this here in this somewhat figurative way. He's saying, I saw Satan fall like lightning, as in not, not saying, hey, Satan has been thrown down now. 
saying, I saw it. He's like, he, he's, he's explaining a vision of what's going to happen to him in the future. And even if you believe that that happened at the cross, Jesus is still speaking in a visionary way of something that will happen in the future from his time. But the rest of the New Testament speaks to this as being coming, but not yet having happened yet, because Satan is still the accuser of the brethren. He still comes before the Father and accuses us, and we have this mediator named Jesus who comes before the Father and says, no, no, this one's mine. This one's mine. You leave him alone. But the point of what Jesus is making here is he's like, listen, I've given you authority over these demons. Awesome. But that's not what you should rejoice in. Rejoice in the fact that your name is written in the book of of life in my book of life. We're going to, to, uh, or the, your name is written in heaven. Other places say in the Lamb's book of life. Let's continue on. Verse 21. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and those whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Jesus is full of joy that they have gone out and have cast demons out of people and preached the gospel. They come back with joy, and Jesus gives them one little warning. It's like, don't be excited that the demons know your name. Don't be excited that they come out at, at your voice. Be excited that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, that you are going to spend eternity with me. <clears throat> but then he, he is full of joy at their experiences. Jesus has chosen partnership with us. He doesn't need it. Jesus, God doesn't need to partner with us. He could do everything himself, but he's established this kingdom where he's chosen partnership with angels. And now he's chosen partnership with us. Jesus didn't need to send these people out ahead of him where he was going. He could have done all of this himself, but he chose that partnership. And and when we engage in that partnership with him, he rejoices in it. He loves it. It excites him. And I love seeing that emotion here. Continuing on. Verse 23. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it. And hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Jesus is telling them, this is a moment of prophetic fulfillment. That there's prophets and kings who understood that this day was coming. And they're like, oh man, I want to be a part of that. But they died long before they could have ever had a chance to see it. And Jesus is saying, blessed are you, these, these 72 disciples, and who maybe there's more listening at this point. Blessed are you because you get to see the things that the prophets knew were coming and longed to see but didn't get to see. And you and I today, we inherit the blessing of what they saw. And not only that, Jesus told them that I'm going away, but I'm sending the Holy Spirit It's actually better that I send you the Holy Spirit than I even be with you. So we today, because he has given us the blessing of the Holy Spirit, we have a blessing even beyond what the apostles had. According to his own words, according to Jesus, we are blessed beyond even them because we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us and working through us today. So let us cultivate this active, living, thriving relationship with the Holy Spirit. I encourage you as we go through the book of Luke, commit to reading the book of Luke 10 times in these 10 weeks as we go through it. And you will begin to accidentally pray these things back to the Holy Spirit. And you will fellowship with the Holy Spirit around God's word. And that is a powerful thing. For the 10-week Bible study, I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and I can't wait to see you next time.